Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our next panel, How Media Platforms Shape Consumer Realities, with Stephen Hayes, Editor and CEO of The Dispatch, Brian Stelter, Chief Media Correspondent for CNN, Lauren Williams, Co-Founder of Capital B, and moderated by Jim Rutenberg, Writer-at-Large of The New York Times. Oh, sorry. Okay, she's not here. 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 She's not on the stage as sort of the frontline workers. Um, we're kind of in this new world when I think when we all started out, uh, you didn't, you just did, had a very different mission in a way when it came to misinformation, disinformation. Brian and I were talking about this. It wasn't like a term that was used. I, I think the first time I met David Axelrod was back when I did ad boxes. Our biggest sort of truth squatting was the political ads. And uh, <laughs> Axelrod, eh, we can talk about that later. <laughs> but. But, um, but everybody up here has made combating misinformation and disinformation, which is really what, partly what journalism is, very much a part of their mission, but in, in very different ways. And I noticed the panels haven't quite worked this way, but I, I just thought that each panelist could maybe start out by describing your mission, because all three uh, of our guests here have, are starting new endeavors. Uh, so maybe you could just talk about y your, your theory of the case for how you started your uh, your new publications, or in Brian's case, your new show, and um, how combating misinformation and disinformation is very much central to what you uh, have talked about in your mission statements, and Brian, you on, on your show. So, sure. Steve, do you Start with me. Ahead? Sure. Yeah. Uh, happy, happy to talk about the dispatch. Um, <laughs> Jonah and I, uh, Jonah, who you heard from earlier today, and I started the dispatch in the fall of 2019. And as Jim said, we, we sort of put front and center this idea that we were starting a new media company to do a lot of the things that journalism has been doing for years. Uh, we wanted to combine sort of transparency about our political views. We're center right. We call ourselves center right. We don't object if you call us conservative. I'm pretty conservative. With sort of old school traditional journalism practices, which means go and report the hell out of stuff. Um, spend time talking to your sources, provide depth and context rather than just hot takes. And our kind of theory of the case, and when we looked at the market, if you start, if you think of the, the uh, political media, political journalism as a spectrum, and you start in the middle and you move to the left, <clears throat> it's very crowded. Uh, you start in the center, and there, it, it's densely packed all the way to the left. If you start in the center and you move to the right, in our view, there was a gaping hole in sort of the center right. And, um, and I'm, I'm talking about it in this sense in ideological terms. But it was also the case, particularly as we looked at the center right, where if you, if you started and you asked the people who were running the organizations, starting in the center and moving all the way to the left, what do you do? Virtually every one of the people running those organizations would mention reporting and mention it prominently, probably early in the, in the answer. And if you started on the center right and asked the same question, in our view, very few people would front with reporting, would say that's really important to, to report. And we thought in very sort of um, humble ways that we could do that. And we know reporting is resource intensive. Um, we know it's going to cost a lot to send people places. We know it's going to cost a lot to hire reporters. But that could be our contribution. So that's basically where we started. And, and we're not trying to change the world, but we think we can have a pretty significant impact in this, in this space that we occupy. Hi. Well, um, Capital B is a local national nonprofit news organization for black audiences across the country. Um, it was, or the idea for it was born in June of 2020 kind of in the midst of uh, the George Floyd protests. My co-founder, Koto Oforiata, and I were both newsroom leaders and media executives, and were sort of looking out at the landscape of mainstream media's failures around covering 
um, race and covering black people and black communities, um, that combined with um, some of what black journalists in these newsrooms were saying, really made us feel like it was a very important opportunity to create alternatives instead of simply just focusing on how do we fix the newsrooms that already exist. Um, and as we started you know, mapping out what we were going to do, the idea of a capital B being able to combat misinformation and disinformation in um, black communities and among black audiences who have lost trust um, in the media for very, I think, understandable reasons, became kind of like our guiding light in this, that if we created something that worked really hard to build trust in communities that did original reporting and didn't focus on takes, um, we could we could really have an in um, in in making a difference, and it, as we you know as we were thinking about the idea, it went far beyond George Floyd. You know, COVID um, misinformation is an enormous problem, and and so that was really our our theory that we were going to have a national newsroom doing in depth reporting on the issues that matter most to black people across the country, and then we were going to open local newsrooms in. Um, cities and regions that had lar large black populations. And through a really intensive community engagement process where we do listening and focus groups and um, really in-person um, interaction with our intended audience, we can build trust um, so that we could be in a really good position um, in the future, the long game, uh, to be the, the destination for is this thing real, is this thing true, what's really happening. Mm. And we, um, we've, we launched on January 31st, so we're very new. <laughs> and I'm from CNN, an obscure cable channel founded by Ted Turner. Should I start there? <laughs> um, we actually just started something new as well, CNN Plus, which is a streaming service that launched last week. I'm now doing a daily show on CNN Plus, along with my Sunday work on reliable sources. And through it all, Jim, I think the theme is uh, what's real and what's not, what's reliable and what's not. Uh, the, the title of my program for 30 years ago is much more relevant today than it was uh, at the outset. Uh, and I, I find as we talk about disinformation, there are so many examples that we can all agree are, are awful and clearly wrong and, uh, you know, birtherism came up on this stage last night. We didn't use the term, at least I didn't use the term birtherism when I wrote about that for the New York Times in 2008. There wasn't a language, there wasn't a framework for what we now know and what we're now combating. So there's been progress on that front. But I worry about uh, the ordinary individuals, not the public figures who, who are up here today and so much, but the ordinary individuals whose lives are turned upside down by misinformation. Um, there's a meme that goes around of me and a couple of my colleagues, it's pictures of our faces from CNN that says, why were these men on Jeffrey Epstein's plane? And of course, there's uh, who, who the heck is Jeffrey Epstein, right? Never met the man, would never be on his plane. But how do I disprove? How do I disprove that disinformation? How am I supposed to, how am I supposed to disprove that? Again, public figures seem to mostly tolerate the lies that have overwhelmed the sewers and the swamps of the web. But what about the 10th grader or the 11th grader who gets smeared on TikTok and it spreads around the entire school? That's disinformation too. And at least I, you know, I have a job and I'm compensated for for, for, for what I do, and as a result, there's crazy lies about me on the internet, but what about my kids when they grow up and see those lies? I think we're, we're in those early stages of disinformation where I, I'm really interested now in the, I don't wanna say it's trickle-down effects, but what's happening to ordinary people who have their lives turned upside down by these lies? Barack Obama's always gonna be able to handle it, even though it's gonna be unpleasant. But what about that 10th grader? And that's where I would start. And you know, you think about that, um, the sewer that he has you, referred to it. Um, oh, it and, stinks. And, yeah. <laughs> and all the garbage that is floating around. I mean, part of the issue is, um, we've talked about the tech part, there's also this um, trust or lack thereof right. in, in the news, in our business, right? And we could get to the causes of that. I mean, some of this was, um, you know, there have been attacks over decades, there have been, we've made our own mistakes. But I guess for um, starting with Stephen Lauren, you're both addressing audiences that are, either never had trust maybe or lost trust and is that is that trust uh, can you get it back 
how, and is, are there some cases where you have to write off parts of your target audience because maybe they're just, they'd rather read the Epstein thing about Brian <laughs> <laughs> or believe it? Um, I, you know, we launched Capital B and I think sometimes it comes across that, that we're trying to say that we're kind of the end all be all of black media, we absolutely are not. There's an incredibly important legacy of black newspapers, black local news um, that are very trusted by the community. Um, it's not enough news <laughs> um, and they're not, you know, then, and a lot of them are subject to a lot of the business issues that local news at large is, is, is um, victim to. Um, and, but, but the existence of that, the existence of that um, history and culture to me suggests that there is, this is fixable if we put more resources into it, if we focus on um, alternatives to the biggest institutions and we listen. And I think that's very hard to do on a national level um, to figure out what's happening in people's lives, what they most want to know, what they most need to understand. And that is why local news is so important and reinvigorating local news is so important because that is where the solutions to some of what is swirling nationally, that's where the solutions exist. I always like to say that everyone trusts the local meteorologists when there's a tornado warning in your town. Almost everybody trusts the local news when there's an emergency. Um, but beyond that, it gets really hard. And politics, the trust deficit is obviously the most severe by far. Um, you can have a great meteorologist team, but then people still aren't gonna trust your political coverage. Well, this helps me cue up Steve because there's, the, there's another one of these polls on trust in media. It just came out like yesterday. I think it's The Economist and um, YouGov. And it has the sort of window Steve talked about, about ideological spectrum in the news. Right. And the only two uh, kind of news outlets that are above 50% on the Republican side were the Weather Channel. <laughs> the Weather Channel, right. And Fox News. And so Steve, you're kind of, you're trying to get part, I believe, right, at least part of that audience that sees Fox News as the only option, or is that sort of part of your thing? Sure, And we yeah. can talk about your own dalliance. We'd love a big too. chunk of that. Um, you know, when, when, um, when Joan and I started this, if you, if you go back at the, the, the beginning of the way that we thought about this was, there are so much, well, first of all, let me take a cue from, from Lauren. There are lots of places on the center, right, that are doing good reporting. Lots of individual reporters who are doing good work. And some of them are employed by Fox News. The news side of Fox News, there are some real pros at Fox News and they do great work and they care deeply about what they're doing. And it's why in some cases they're so frustrated with what they see you know, at eight o'clock in particular um, at other times. Um, but th that, that group, if you, if you think of sort of the, approaching the problem in, a, in kind of a big picture way, um, we think that they are gettable. I mean, we think that a lot of them are gettable. We hear this anecdotally, of course. We've seen some data that, that supports it. Um, but what we're not going to do is shape our coverage in an effort to get that audience. And so much of what you see on the center right, I would say in particular, it's true of the center left as well, but on the center right in particular is this sort of affirmation journalism where people come to the sites because they just want to nod their heads with what they're being told. And it's, a, it's the news product, I mean, news product of a lot of these places where you know, they'll go, you'll have junior reporters go and read the Washington Post and the New York Times and read an entire piece, pick out the most, the, the thing most likely to cause outrage. Right. Grab it, write three paragraphs about it, put a, a headline on it that will really make people on the center right mad right. and splash that and hope to get a drudge link. I mean, <laughs> that was the model for years mm -hmm. on the center right. And it often involved very little reporting um, it didn't really involve, I mean, certainly very little original reporting, and it was basically outrage bait. Right. That's horrible. That's a terrible way for people to get their information. So we very deliberately uh, set up kind of against that. Um, I have to say, though, there is a reason that you had roughly half of the country that was open to that kind of outrage bait. 
right? I mean, I would argue, as, as Jonah mentioned earlier today, this has been a long time coming. I think the, the mainstream media, and I, sometimes I hate that term, but you, I hope you understand what I mean by it. Broadly, the mainstream media did a lot of things that led conservatives to think they're not gonna treat us fairly. Um, you know, talked about uh, Dan Rather earlier today. There was actually a Times story. Remember, that was in the weeks before the 2004 election. There was a Times series story that was splashed a week before the election about this weapons depot in Iraq called al Qaqa, And it was a big deal. The US had basically lost control of this weapons depot. And the Times reported on it and then ran three dozen plus stories between that original story and election day, in effect saying George W. Bush couldn't keep track of this weapons depot, how can we trust him to be president? The Kerry campaign jumped on it, it became a thing. I mean, and, and as the Times can do, and really only the Times can do, everybody else picked up on it. This was one of the main issues that was debated over that last week of the campaign. And then it went away. And then it wasn't reported on anymore. There was a mention in late November, there was something in the spring, one additional story ever, as far as I can tell, at the Times about that. And look, I'm not saying all conservatives are angry at the time over, over al Kaka, <laughs> but what happened was talk radio picked up on me. You're saying the story was Kaka. We talked about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we picked up on it, we talked about it at the time. And you see enough of that, particularly you know, on the heels of, of Dan Rather. CBS News had a, a hand in reporting that al Kaka story too. And you see that and it becomes a pattern. You get to the point where conservatives say, I don't trust any of it. And that's where too many of them are today. But wasn't there, okay, so. Isn't it that, much worse than that though? Aren't we much more screwed than that? Like isn't the situation so much worse than just flawed, even fucked up news stories by the New York Times? Like, this sure. is the problem that they hate, that 30 to 40% of the country hates journalism as it's practiced today? Sure, it's Which much worse than that. why we need reporting from places it's, like It's much worse than that. Like, isn't and, it so much worse? But, but wasn't there, we've made our mistakes and we will continue to make our mistakes, right? But this came up in an earlier panel today. And I don't, I don't really remember that story that well. I was covering that campaign. Um, so I'd have to go back and read those stories, but okay, let's. I didn't see your byline on any <laughs> yeah. of the stories, just so you know. Uh, but I don't, I kind of vaguely remember that, but let's, I don't, so I don't wanna affirm whether I would agree that those stories were bad or not. I just I kind of can't speak to that, but let's say take it as something was off with those stories. There is a fact-based um, practice, right, that we all try, and there has been mixed into this, and I'm not saying it's everything, a movement to also denigrate the mainstream press. No question. And so, and you've sort of lived through some of this yourself, so are, I've seen you speak to this. It, did, did those two things, the natural sort of um, issues with the mainstream press and a center-left bias come together with a, a more concerted campaign to delegitimize Absolutely. the press to like get, help get us where we are? Absolutely, no question. I don't think, you know, it, it, yeah. Look, think, think back to the 2020, 2012 Republican presidential primary. Newt Gingrich almost won that primary by running against the media. Right. That was very deliberate. It was his strategy. That's what he wanted to do. And I think it, it accelerated this to a certain extent. And I'm, I, I want to be clear that I'm, I'm not saying because the mainstream media had these problems and conservatives could point them out, therefore, you know, Donald Trump is entitled to make stuff up and have conservative media amplify them. Not at all. In fact, my, my point is almost the opposite. But I think it's important, if you want to get to, the, to a place where we really understand the roots of some of this, it's important that people say, like, hey, this is how, you know, roughly half of the country, yeah. see, not, not half of the country, but the, the, the politically active types, this is how they, they see this, and this is one of the reasons that explains why there's so much mistrust. Right, Lauren, you are addressing audiences that have a whole different basket of reasons to mistrust the press. And do you think that, that when we talk about this issue in panels like this one, I feel like that often gets missed. So from just what you've heard from your audience early, right, you've been how many weeks, um, 
have you gotten a sense of how bad the alienation is and, you know, and how much of that is the press's fault? Uh, you know, I think there's so much tied up in just the idea of like institutions, you know, inst big institutions like the press, like uh, the government, like medicine that have historically um, in various ways mistreated black people in America. And it all, I think, kind of combines into a general, you know, mistrust of officials. Um, uh, for not everybody, but for, for, for the chunk of folks who have that mistrust. And, and so that makes it really difficult to think about um, the press being able to fully solve a problem that is deeply rooted <laughs> in um, our country's racist history and past. So like, I'm not taking on that job. That's, <laughs> you know, that's way, way bigger than me. But I think that what we can do is, is be a trusted storyteller and, um, and listen. You know, there's a lot of uh, the Center for um, Media Engagement at uh, University of Texas uh, did a survey a couple of years ago of, of um, black adults about their, um, their feelings about the media and so many um, say they trust the media to cover generally, but do not trust the media to cover their stories. Mm. Um, do not uh, trust them to understand the complexities of their communities because when they look on the TV and they read the bylines, they aren't being done by people who they feel would understand. And um, many responded and said they have never met a journalist in the wild. Um, and for some people who live in, in, in communities um, where there's a lot of crime, it's like the only time you see journalists is when s something awful happens. And you, know, you don't get follow-ups, <laughs> you don't, um, maybe, and, and that's even if they're gonna cover your neighborhood at all. Did that create, an, have you found this yet, again, very early in your organization's history now, but that that's created an opening for misinformed belief or a, a willingness to, glom onto disinformation, say, about vaccines or the pandemic? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, you know, in the absence of official sources that you feel like you can trust, the unofficial sources, the, the counterintuitive um, ideas, the, 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 like, I guess, like, false debunking of what the official narrative is, is, is really compelling and, um, you know, Joan, who, who spoke earlier, and they, you know, they, she does amazing work about, you know, helping people to, to spot fake news or, or, you know, be more um, media literate. And I think that that's a, a very important chunk of, of this problem. But I also think that there are folks who like that it's not real or like that it doesn't look real, yes. <laughs> like that it doesn't look like it came from a newspaper or um, from TV news because, you know, they're looking for alternatives to that. This is much more of a demand side issue than a supply side issue. Right, and Brian, your every day, your show and every week, um, and in your segments, you're addressing this kind of the, the false beliefs that really take on um, part of the media infrastructure that runs with those false beliefs. And in, in your approach to combating that, I, I wonder if you could kind of fill us in on that and tell us how it went, how it's gone, because it's, you get counterattacked. In well, I'm probably doing it all wrong. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think that's what we wrestle with in newsrooms all the time. What are the best ways to deal with nonsense out in the information world? And it seems like ignoring it is not the right way, uh, but then figuring out the right way is much harder. As, as you all were talking, I wrote down flawed or frauds, uh, because I think this is what a lot of this comes down to about people's beliefs in journalism. If you know that we are flawed, you know that we are trying to earn your trust every day, we're gonna screw up along the way, but we're trying our best. If you think that we are frauds, then you're opting out of mainstream journalism. You're not, you, you're not inclined to um, uh, trust but verify you're inclined to hate. 
and increasingly journalists are hate objects, and I think we should just be blunt about how bad the environment is out there for many journalists, especially national journalists who are operating uh, in, in this environment. Um, it's, it's only getting worse. Uh, it's only getting more of, a, more of a sewer. So what do we do? Do we teach our kids not to play in the sewer? I, I think that's gonna be a big part of, a big part of the answer. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of meandering. My point is, flawed versus frauds may be a helpful way to think about this. Clearly, journalists are flawed, trying every day to be better, trying to earn people's trust, but there's a portion of the country that doesn't know that to be true. They've never been inside a newsroom. They may have never met a journalist, which is such an important note from, you know, that yeah, if, if you don't, um, and by the way, if you have been a journalist, you may have had a bad experience. Mm -hmm. You may have been misquoted. I mean, how many times have, have you been misquoted Steve, by, by, uh, by other news outlets? Fair number. Uh, you know, Fair and number. so- Not this guy, not you, <laughs> not you. <laughs> so we, we know it's a flawed system, but if you believe it's a fraudulent system, then you're gonna opt out entirely and you're gonna go into the Joe Rogan world instead. Uh, and and that, that might be a lot of fun uh, until he books quack doctors. But but you're, you talk about this a lot and try to shine a light on this, and do you think you've broken through? Or, did, or does it sometimes feel like it just becomes its own sort of partisan warfare? Oh, I think most people want to know what is real in the world. I, I truly, and this is the optimist in me, most people don't want to be fooled. Most people don't want to be tricked. They don't want to be taken advantage of. They don't want to have grifters going after their money. Uh, you know, look at the current right-wing narrative about Disney loves pedophiles. This is crazy stuff that's out there being pushed by Fox almost every hour of the day. Um, and and I'm, I'm obviously, I'm, I'm summarizing it in a dramatic fashion, but it's anti-Disney, Disney's woke, why, why, do they, why do they want kids to learn about sex? Pedophiles is the, the key word of the week in these right-wing circles. This, this crazy, hateful stuff, uh, but most people don't want to live in that world. I really don't believe most people, I don't believe most conservatives want to live in that right wing fantasy land where Disney is the worst place on earth, you know? Uh, I, I just, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't ring true to me when I go out and I walk across campus or I go up to the, when I'm in the real world, it is a much more pleasant place than when I'm in the internet world, when I'm in the virtual world these days. And uh, if anything, you know, we get back to a slow news movement, the way we have a slow food movement, a more of a, you know, that all of those, all that. those terms we apply to our food, <laughs> yeah. organic and whatnot, uh, can be applied to our news and we'd be better off uh, to the extent that we can get offline. Hey, what did your editor announce a couple hours ago? Y'all are supposed to spend less time on Twitter? Less time on Twitter. We Doesn't can, that we sound interesting? Get to that. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's talk about that down the road here today. Hopefully we can have time to get to that. But Steve, <laughs> no, I'd lo I love that topic. But Steve, um, you know, you uh, may not remember this, but you left um, Fox News, you were, were your contributor, in somewhat dramatic fashion. Um, I think uh, Jonah talked about it a little bit today. But that act was a statement, I know that you did it for personal reasons, and I'd like you to talk about that some, where you were coming from, and maybe share the story for those who might not totally know it. But that also, that act was a statement, right, that uh, you're about something else that isn't uh, Tucker Carlson's false flag theory, um, which was uh, shown on uh, Fox Nation as a documentary, and, and also, he was talking about that on his show on regular Fox News Plenty, but did that, how did that, what was the reaction among your readership and the audience you'd like to be reaching? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, it's interesting that you, you introduce it that way, that it was a dramatic fashion. I mean, I suppose, objectively, you're right. But we didn't try to make it terribly dramatic. We, <laughs> we did as, that. As I recall, <laughs> we, we gave two interviews. Um, ben and then, Smith did And that. otherwise didn't, you know, didn't sort of go around talking about it a lot. Um, and I think, again, I'll speak. I tried. I tried to get you to talk to me. Uh-oh. We, uh -oh. You, were, you were not alone at, at yeah. CNN um, and MSNBC, as you might imagine. Um, speaking just, just for myself, um, you know, I, I watched the, the, the there was a, a teaser. I think it was 74 seconds, if I remember it correctly. How many seconds? I think 74, <laughs> but don't quote me. I could get that wrong, and I don't want to be peddling false information on it. <laughs> um, but it was short, and it aired on, on Tucker Carlson's main program, and it was totally outrageous. I mean, it suggested that the federal government was launching something akin to a war on terror against half of the country. <laughs> and Sorry. you might think I'm exaggerating. That's close to an exact quote. Yeah. 
And my own view when I saw that was, you can't do this to people. You can't tell them this because some of them are gonna act on it. And that struck me as deeply, deeply irresponsible. Um, you, you know, we, we talk about filter bubbles and people getting their news out of soda straws. If you have, if you've taken this journey where you no longer trust mainstream media outlets and you don't read the New York Times or you don't watch ABC News, what have you, and you're getting information increasingly from, you know, someone like Tucker or from some less reputable conservative websites, there's no counterbalance there. Nobody's telling you, gosh, no, that's not happening. Um, and I think, you know, for me, I just reached a point with, with that in particular where I said, I can't be, I can't be a part of that. And, you know, I think the reaction among dispatch members was, was overwhelmingly positive, in part because in this, you know, manifesto thing that we posted when we launched, we said, don't sign, don't sign up, don't subscribe to, to us, don't become members if you just want to nod your head. If this is some sort of political engagement for you and you think, you know, we're always going to be on this side and you can nod your head and have your views affirmed, we're not for you. We're going to spend our time challenging our own assumptions. We're going to challenge your assumptions. Um, we'd love to have you along for the ride, but it's not going to be that kind of a place. So I think you know, it's, there's a self-selection bias going on there. We, people are members because they came to us for that, and that might explain the reaction. Um, but I think pretty, pretty positive in general. So, but do we all, as a, as a group on this stage, believe now that, and it's, it's kind of a theme running through this entire very excellent conference, is uh, that, let's talk about that confirmation bias. People can find any actually valid information on its own to support a belief that isn't really accurate reflection of reality, but it's out there. And it's not just through outlets, it's just finding stuff around the web. And uh, if, am I wrong to see this as a crisis? Because if our business is first and foremost about reflecting the world accurately, or at least that's a, one key premise of what we do, if our likely readers now can find things that will reflect a different reality and don't trust us, have we, then we're, we can't accomplish our job, right? So do we, do you all write off the people who, who they're never gonna believe you, so I'm not gonna try to reach them, or, or do you still see it as part of your job to break through, like where's the line of, they don't trust us, I can't give them what they want, and so that's just, we're gonna accept that that's part of the country now and, and that's something our, our organizations can't do anymore, which is reach broader audiences with truth. Mm. Lauren? Well, I, <laughs> well, I'm trying to think about how to answer. This is kind of a mainstream, <clears throat> uh, 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 non kind of um, ethnic media question, I think. Because Good. what, Say why, yeah. the way that I thought about this I, I was previously the editor-in-chief of Vox, um, and then I left to start Capital B, and the way that I was thinking about this was that focusing in on a smaller group was going to be something that could be really effective here. Mm -hmm. that, that centering black people in our work, that you know, having the capacity to kind of wrap our arms in our local newsrooms around stories in a really meaningful way, um, can go much further towards gathering or catching some of these people who are disaffected or who are just like simply not engaged at all. Like it's not even about like I don't trust them. Like it's just like the news isn't for me so I don't pay attention to it. Um, I think it's, it's a much easier bite of the apple. And so that's, you know, that was part of my motivation here. Um, I think national news is, much harder to do that <laughs> um, because you're doing when you're when you're a, a national mainstream news who's like I want to um, uh, eat the whole apple and bring everyone in and get really high ratings or tens of subscribers. I think that ends up. Um, I think that's a, that's really tough because you end up maybe compromising in order to reach a brighter swath of people, um, and I think that that. 
is where you see a lot of criticism um, of the mainstream media from all sides of the political spectrum. Um, and I think that's it's just a bigger problem. Do you, I, if I can cite a specific uh, story, a run of stories, there has been a sort of running, I don't want to just say culture war debate, but it's partly culture war debate about uh, critical race theory. And I noticed that to the extent you guys are covering it right now, it's a story when it's a bill in Georgia, to, to some uh, bill, to, some law to address teaching or not teaching. But it, uh, is, it, it, is there a disconnect in that, very, that specific story with what your audience is dying to hear? Is that debate happening away from your audience a little bit? Or that's oh, absolutely. Not I mean, the, the, the debate, that debate is framed you know, nationally as like white parents' concerns about what's happening to their white kids at school. Um, not about black students and learning about racial history, not about black teachers who can't talk about any of this, not about the black school board members, the black superintendents who are being pushed out of their jobs because simply because they're black. Um, the, the narrative becomes they're like C CRT practitioners. Um, you don't hear about that, maybe a little bit more recently, but just this CRT, despite it being about, well, what is it really about anyway? It's about, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna try to encapsulate that in one word, because um, it's, you know, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily it's about CRT. White fear. Yes. Framed as white fear. Yeah, and, and, um, and it's like, we don't exist in this conversation. And, you know, speaking for myself, I grew up in Virginia. I went through um, Virginia history classes, um, visited Robert E. Lee's house, did a whole bunch of like shady things that didn't provide a lot of context about slavery. <laughs> it's kind of shocking to me that, you know, this is, this is, this is the conversation. So, so yes, we, we want to, reach people who are like, oh, that story's not about me or for me, um, with stories that are about them and for them. And further, I think that CRT is kind of a, a big national story. People are getting information about what is happening in their local schools from like national sources who aren't there, who don't understand, who pick up a, on a story and you know totally mess it up and don't even think about their responsibility there. Um, how many communities have reporters who are covering school board meetings for people who aren't paying subscribers of the local newspaper that's behind a hard paywall? Yeah, I think um, one thing, oh, sorry, Aiden. Yeah, no, I mean, I can stop. I could talk about this I for a really long time. You. I don't want to cut you off. I was actually- <laughs> You asked me a CRT question. <laughs> I was just gonna, I could keep I was going. cutting you off to compliment you. I mean, I think one of the most important things you said was that you, this is a long game. You're playing a long game. We, we came with that same idea, that same approach. I mean, there's a, a media company in, in Britain that I think does really interesting work. Um, I would describe them as, as center left called tortoise media. And the idea is to slow things down. And, and we do that and it's the way that, that you know, we interact with our reporters. And it's a, it's, a, it's a funny dynamic because it's the opposite of the way I think a lot of reporters have come up. Like, mm. can you get it, get it out, put it up, let's get some clicks on it. You know, we have conversations with our reporters where they'll, where they'll come to us and say, I've got this thing. And we just publish our standalone pieces in the morning. We send newsletters kind of uh, when, when it's appropriate. But we tell them to slow it down. Yeah, mm -hmm. take another day. Yeah, it's okay. We're, we're probably not going to know everything that we need to know today. Um, make five more phone calls. Um, and, and if your goal is providing depth, context, and understanding rather than getting clicks, I think that's, you know, again, we're not trying to change the world, we're not trying to change journalism, but we're trying to do the little things that we can do well, and, and I got my phone out not because I was checking my, <laughs> my texts, but because I wanted to see a text that I sent to some of my colleagues uh, over a, a Newsweek article, and I think this is roughly the opposite of what we're trying to do. Uh, the headline was, Kyle Rittenhouse weighs in on Hunter Biden for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Don't Who click cares? it. Don't click it. <laughs> Who cares? You know, I mean, undoubtedly, Kyle Rittenhouse gets a lot of clicks. The Hunter Biden stuff gets a lot of clicks. I think it's a legitimate story, Hunter Biden stuff. But like, really? Is that journalism? That's just crap. Well, 
I, I'll turn it to Brian on this, on that note, um, and the Hunter Biden laptop has been a theme running through this, but uh, so are you are addre addressing a broader audience and you can't, for instance, um, the Hunter Biden laptop, there's a decision made how much coverage to give it, how much not to give it. Um, a more conservative organization in last year or whatever, what year are we in, uh, might have paid a ton of attention to it. Your organization made a different decision. Um, you can't, in making certain decisions, if, if you don't cover the thing that's really blowing up on either side of the divide, then you're seen as you're not really doing that. You're biased and you're blowing off that part of the country that cares about it. So how do you deal with that? Uh, maybe ask me when it's time to retire and I'll, I'll have figured it out by then. I, I think this is a, there's a tension between big American newsrooms that want to check something out themselves, that don't want to rely on other outlets, that don't want to just repeat and regurgitate. But then there's an audience expectation of being able to instantly cover every story and have every answer. And I think that there's a tension there. And so in September of, or October of 2020, when the New York Post has something, other outlets can't match it. There's this pressure, why aren't you confirming this? Why aren't you focusing on this? Why aren't you leading on this? Because we haven't matched it, we haven't confirmed it. Now lately, lately right. the Times and the Post have, and that's notable. And CNN had a story last week about the federal investigation into Hunter. Uh, but I think there's this tension between fast and slow journalism, perhaps, uh, between people who know how newsrooms work and the vast majority of those who don't. I love what you said about how a lot of people just aren't tuned in at all, right? They don't, they don't care, they don't, they don't think the news is for them. And that's why we need a thousand startups. We need a thousand more of what, of what you two are doing. Because if people are growing up disinclined to care about the news or disinclined to trust existing outlets, we need to get, there need to be a lot of new, uh, new options, new on-ramps to be a part of the news system. I mean, in the same way that we're all members of the media now, we all actually have more of a responsibility now. If, we, if you have an Instagram and our Twitter or a TikTok, you're making media, you're making content. There's a certain responsibility that comes with that power. Uh, and uh, so I, I increasingly think it's about the audience as much as it is about the news outlets that are, that are covering them. But I, the other thing I would say is that what you said about uh, Newsweek, that spectrum's always gonna exist, right? There's always gonna be uh, clickbait trash, tabloid stuff, and then there's always gonna be the Atlantic, and there's always gonna be all this stuff in between. What I'm really most interested in now is how do we, how do we help people navigate that and see the difference? In a world where, you know, thank you to Apple for, for creating a phone where everything looks the same, right? My mom's blog and the New York Times. How do we help people know the difference? That I think is a huge, you know, again, I go back to that 10th grader who gets smeared on TikTok and has no recourse, has no ability to clear her name. Uh, how do we help people navigate that world and know what is, and it's even harder when someone takes over Newsweek and turns into a clickbait farm because Newsweek used to be a trusted brand. Well, I think that, just really quick, I think the big, the elephant in the room here uh -oh. is that we have a resource issue. Mm. And the big, the big institutions do, the small ones do. New, the news business is but in trouble. And a lot of what we're talking about here is resource and slow news. There's a reason there's fast news, <laughs> because you have to be fast so you can make money. Um, slow news is a lot more expensive. It means you have less audience. Um, and it is not an option for the business models of some news organizations. Look, there's no dearth of young reporters who want to do slow news. I can't even tell you how many, like, fresh out of college, young black reporters I've talked to, and they're like, oh, yeah, like, I think, like, I, my, the thing I want to do is, like, case for reparations type stuff. Um, and I'm like, okay, well, that's maybe later in your career. Like, what do you, like, you know, so, like, the, the will is there, the interest is there, the, there is not a thriving business model outside of a very small number of organizations who can afford to do that. And so we cannot solve this problem without fixing the business problem. Because I do think, you know, we're talking a lot about, um, I mean, we're being kind of hard on mainstream media, but there's, um, they've, they've got some big challenges to making changes. Um, we're having to move to questions. I want to make one factual note, but, um, and maybe this could be a question, but really fast. The Times, uh, we wrote about the laptop, whatever, a few weeks ago, and it's Times admits, Times admits, laptop is real. In fact, you know, before November, we had written 
FBI sources were telling us that there sure. was no indication that there was disinformation on the laptop. We ran a bunch of stories. And so some of that, the coverage of the coverage now is, mm -hmm. has lost perspective on what actually happened, at least at least in our, with us, but I imagine with other organizations. And it brings me to, if we can answer this quickly, um, do we need to defend journalism more or do we alienate people if we just, if we're having our own political campaign to defend ourselves or PR campaign? When we get 10, uh, 10 stories right and one wrong, we need to point the 10 out again and again and again because every single night of this year, Fox News will make an effort to destroy those news outlets. So the answer is yes. Maybe they, maybe they agree. No, I do, I, I, do, I do agree. I think that we, I think we need to, and it's not so much about like worrying about the political ramifications of mistakes. I think that we owe it to the audience to be transparent when we mess up and about the process that led us there so that they, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just a bare trust thing. And corrections win trust, I believe. When I, yes. when I misspell your name in my newsletter, and then the next night I write, yeah, I screwed up Jim's name. What was I thinking? Thank you to all the readers who told me. You won't be the first. You won't be the first. <laughs> all those readers who were helpful, they were a part of the process. They became part of the media. I think that's actually a win. It's a net positive. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say aggressive corrections is one way to regain trust. I mean, I think, yeah, making the kind of, you know, pointing out the, the, the factual errors that you, that you just pointed out probably helps, but I mean, we're expected to get it right. You know, we should, we should get it true, right. If true. you spend a lot of time Absolutely. telling people that we did the job the way that we're supposed to do, I guess that probably will feel defensive to people and probably won't persuade them that, that you deserve kudos for doing what you should have done right. in the first place. Mm -hmm. You're right. Mm -hmm. um, so questions, sorry, let that go so long. Yep. I mean, what a great question. That is a great question. Thank you. Oh, the question, the question was, can more be done uh, among the likes of us to bring the country together? We're talking about addressing different audiences. So, right, how do we, what can be done to bring the, the, the nation together in terms of a shared fact-based view of reality? Yeah, I mean, I would say candidly, probably not enough. We probably don't do enough of that. Um, you know, I, I listened to Lauren talk about how to report on CRT and the various perspectives that, that she described. Absolutely, great, uh, great story ideas, great news. Um, wouldn't have probably occurred to me right away, um, but I'm tuned into you know the people who are saying, hey, CRT is terrible, CRT is terrible, and the, the, the sort of culture war fight on that, but yeah, anything that we can do to sort of bring more perspective and, and you know, I don't believe in conservative facts, I don't believe in liberal facts, I don't believe in alternative facts, I believe in facts, and anything that we can do to get closer to understanding what those facts are, and then have a big bloody fight about what to do about them or the policy implications or what they mean or what have you. Um, anything we can do to have conversations that bring us to a better understanding of what those shared facts are. It's, Hugely positive. I heard a song lyric in that. Uh, next question. <laughs> that you should set that to music. Anyone have a mic? Yeah, there. Uh, hi, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Christopher Phillips. I'm a first year at the college. Uh, my question is for Mr. Seltzer. Uh, you've all spoken extensively about Fox News being a purveyor of uh, disinformation. Uh, but CNN is right up there with them. They push the Russian collusion hoax. They push the Jesse Smollett hoax. They smeared Justice Kavanaugh as a rapist, and they also smeared Nick Sandman as a white supremacist. And yes, they dismissed the Hunter Biden laptop affair as pure Russian disinformation. Uh, with mainstream corporate journalists becoming little more than uh, apologists and cheerleaders for the regime, is it time to finally declare that the, uh, the canon of journalistic ethics is dead or no longer operative? 
uh, all the mistakes of the mainstream media and CNN in particular seem to magically all go in one direction. Are we expected to believe that this is all just some sort of random coincidence or is there something else behind it? It's too bad, it's time for lunch. <laughs> uh, you have 30 uh, seconds. No, I mean, there is, a, there is a clock that says 30 seconds, but, but I think my honest answer to you, and I will, I'll come over and talk in more detail after this, is that I think you're describing a different channel than the one that I watch. Uh, but I understand that that is a popular right-wing narrative about CNN. I think it's important when we talk about shared reality and democracy, all these networks, all these news outlets have to defend democracy. And when they screw up, admit it. Uh, but when Benjamin Hall, the Fox correspondent, was wounded in Ukraine, the news crews at CNN and the New York Times stopped what they were doing, and they tried to help. They tried to help him get out of the country. They tried to find the dead crew members. That's what news outlets do. That's how they actually do work together to your question about sharing those kinds of connections and trust. We don't talk about it enough, though. We don't share that reality about how that happens. And with regards to the regime, I think you mean the President Biden? The last time I spoke with a Biden aide, we yelled at each other. So that's the reality of the news business that people don't see, that people don't hear. They imagine that it's a, a situation that simply is not. But I think your question, it speaks to the failure of journalism to show our work and show the reality of how our profession operates. We have a lot of work to do, I think. Okay, well, I've got a blinking red light. I know, light. we could keep going, but there's lunch right out in the hallway. I know, I've got a, it's lunchtime. Um, <laughs> I don't want to end on failure of journalism. Um, I think I can speak for all of us that we're, you know, we all lose sleep trying to get it right, at the, certainly on this stage. Most people want to know what's true. And, and we um, got to help them. But we also, I don't know, I think we all want to be better every day, right? True. Did that give us exactly. something a little more? <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, uh, IOP and Atlantic, for having us. And thank thanks you, you all thank for coming. Thank you. Time. Thanks.